This is Michael Altos recording the second lecture, IV Anesthetics, Induction Agents and Sedatives, Part 1. I'd like to start by reviewing some of the characteristics of an ideal IV anesthetic. Uh, there is, of course, no ideal IV anesthetic, but the ideal agent would have a series of properties that we're always searching for. These include being water-soluble and stable, so the drug is ready to draw up and use at a moment's notice. Lack of pain on injection, no burning, uh, no tissue damage if the drug extravasates and uh, the IV blows. A low incidence of histamine release or hypersensitivity so that patients don't get a rash or hypotensive um, if the drug is given quickly. A nice rapid smooth onset of action so patients go to sleep quickly. And then rapid metabolism to inactive metabolites. That way we don't have to worry about liver or kidney function compromising the use of this drug and uh, we still have a very quick onset and offset of action. This would be a steep dose response curve and we could titrate it uh, to the kind of action we wanted, whether it would be a uh, infusion for a sedation or induction of anesthesia for either a short uh, procedure or a general anesthetic. We'd like to see cardiac and respiratory depression be as minimal as possible. Uh, we'd like to have brain function be decreased when the drug is given, so decreasing ICP and cerebral metabolic uh, rate of oxygen consumption. And then patients should recover smoothly and quickly with minimal side effects like nausea, amnesia, headache, dizziness, and just feeling lousy. Again, there is no ideal IV anesthetic, but each of our uh, drugs that we have available to us shares one or more of these characteristics, and that's how we help decide which drug we should use as we select the anesthetic for given clinical situations. The first class of drugs we're going to speak about are the barbiturates. For many years, barbiturates were the mainstay of IV anesthetic agents, replaced in more recent times by propofol, and they still have use in our clinical anesthetic practice. There are a number of different kinds of barbiturates, phenobarbital, methohexital, thiopental, thiamylol, cecobarbital, and I've highlighted in bold some of those that are uh, more commonly seen in the clinical setting. These drugs work at the reticular activating system, which is the consciousness center located in your brain stem. They work both by suppressing excitatory transmitters, neurotransmitters like acetylcholine, as well as enhancing inhibitory transmission through uh, GABA pathways. Barbiturates are classically broken down into two subcategories, thiobarbiturates, which are sulfur-containing drugs like thiopental and thioamylol, and oxybarbiturates like methohexital. And we'll talk about the differences between these two in a little bit. These drugs are very water soluble, but they're very alkaline. The pH is greater than 10, and they're pretty unstable in the refrigerator. So often they have to be prepared from a uh, powdered solution and reconstituted prior to use. These drugs are usually painless when they're injected, uh, unless they extravasate due to a uh, malfunctioning IV catheter. We should point out, and this is something that has been tested on board exams in the past, that intra-arterial injection of a thiobarbiturate uh, will cause crystal formation and can be relatively catastrophic as crystals form in the arterial system of the extremity, leading to thrombosis and even necrosis. And the classic treatment for that has been papaverin, which is a, a vasodilator in order to restore blood flow lidocaine for the pain, and perhaps even a stellate ganglion block, because these patients are at risk for developing chronic pain syndromes. And heparin is used to prevent coagulation. The thiobarbiturates tend to be very lipid-soluble, which makes them very potent, with a very rapid onset and a short duration, as they redistribute into the lipid-soluble tissues. Unfortunately, thiobarbiturates, especially thiopental, is no longer available for use in the United States. This was one of the three drugs used in the lethal injection combination for many years. And for that reason, the manufacturer of thiopental, who's located in Europe, uh, has objected to import of the drug into the United States if it will be used for lethal injections. And the drug is almost completely unavailable in the clinical setting at this time. <clears throat> we also have oxybarbiturates, most commonly methohexital, this drug is not quite as lipid soluble, and so it tends to be a little bit less potent. It has a slower onset and a longer duration of action as it does not redistribute into peripheral tissues that are fat soluble. 
But of the oxybarbiturates, methohexatol is on the shorter acting end of things because of its methyl group. And so practically we don't see a lot of difference between methohexatol and thiopental uh, if we compare the two most common barbiturates. These drugs are typically given IV. Some of them are available orally, but not for our purposes. Usually they would be given orally for sedation or for chronic control of seizure disorders. Uh, they could be given rectally or intramuscularly for premedication, but that's pretty uncommon in my clinical practice. The distribution of these drugs is described by this classic graph that we saw in the previous lecture. Any lipid-soluble drug will have a very fast onset of action as the drug leaves the plasma, quickly crosses the blood-brain barrier and gets into the vessel-rich group. And then after only about 10 to 20 minutes, the drug has completely left the brain after a single dose and has redistributed into peripheral tissues and the patient will show a clinical recovery. In patients who are hypovolemic, who have low protein levels, who are acidotic or elderly, these patients will have higher plasma levels and the drug will have a more prolonged clinical effect and a more pronounced clinical effect. So this is nice for a single dose, but as multiple doses are given, the peripheral compartments begin to saturate and there isn't as much room, so to speak, for the drug to redistribute into these peripheral compartments and the redistribution process becomes slower. So with subsequent redosing of the drug, you'll see longer and longer duration of action. And for that reason, it's a poor choice for maintenance and anesthesia. You can get people off to sleep with these drugs, but if you run an infusion or multiple doses, it will start to build up quite a bit in the body and the recovery will take a very long time. The elimination half-life for these drugs to actually leave the body can range anywhere from 3 to 12 hours depending on the barbiturate being used. These drugs are biotransformed in the liver, they are oxidized, and the two most common barbiturates highlight some of the differences we spoke about in the first lecture. Methohexatol, also known as Brevitol, has a very high hepatic extraction. The liver is very adept at clearing this drug, and so really it's perfusion limited, which means as fast as you can deliver blood to the liver, that's as fast as the liver will metabolize it, and it has a short elimination half-life. On the other hand, thiopental, uh, has a much lower hepatic extraction and we call this capacity limited metabolism. It's really uh, going to be limited not by the hepatic blood flow. You can send as much blood as you want to the liver but the liver will quickly reach its limit as how quickly it can metabolize thiopental. However, liver disease is unlikely to cause a prolonged effect from a single dose so it's still a good induction dose. It's still a good medication for single use but repeated use, you'll start to see a very prolonged clinical effect. The drugs, once they are metabolized, will be excreted in the liver. Uh, while some drugs can be excreted in the liver without any biotransformation, these barbiturates really do need to be biotransformed. And the elimination half-life, as I said before, was 3 to 12 hours, methohexatol being on the shorter end of things, thiopental being on the longer end of things. Again, this is the elimination half-life, so you still may have a very fast recovery profile after a single dose of maybe 10 to 20 minutes. But the drug actually stays in the patient's body, as you can see, for many, many hours, albeit redistributed to the peripheral compartments. Dosing. You may never get to d dose thiopental, the way things look right now, but classically the dose was 3 to 5 milligrams per kilogram IV. I always thought of it as about double the dose of propofol. Infants required even more. And if you were treating someone who had intracranial hypertension or intractable seizures, an infusion could be run. Methohexatol, which you will still see used from time to time, is classically used as an induction dose of 1 to 1.5 1 milligrams per kilogram IV. Next, we'll talk about the effects of the barbiturates. <clears throat> like many of our IV induction agents, these drugs cause hypotension, and a lot of that hypotension is due to venous pooling. Remember, you have a very large number of blood vessels throughout your body, especially in your GI system and in your periphery, and when these, veins, when these uh, veins dilate, a lot of your blood volume will accumulate in those uh, veins, and this venous pooling can contribute to hypotension. Cardiac output will still be maintained until patients become pretty hypovolemic, at which point uh, they can have significant decrease in cardiac output and in blood pressure. Also, our patients who have heart failure or who are beta-blocked 
can show quite a bit of decreased cardiac output and hypotension when induced with barbiturates. <clears throat> so of course you want to be careful in patients who have bad hearts or who may be hypovolemic due to sepsis or bleeding or other causes. Interestingly, the patients show some increased heart rate due to what we call a central vagolytic effect, and that means that they become tachycardic upon induction. In the respiratory system, we see a decrease in both the hypoxic and the hypercapnic drive, which means that patients will tolerate hypoxia and hypercarbia without stimulating their breathing centers. Their airways will obstruct, as we see in all patients who become uh, unconscious. And we do see that some patients uh, who are at risk for bronchospasm due to reactive airway disease may have an increased incidence of bronchospasm when treated with barbiturates. There's also some thought that barbiturates can increase the risk of laryngospasm. In the brain, these drugs, like most IV induction agents, decrease cerebral blood flow and decrease intracranial pressure. They decrease your cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen quite a bit, so much so that you can achieve burst suppression on EEG, which is sort of the equivalent of a flatline or almost a flatline EEG. And some people think this may be protective in a case where there is ischemia to the brain. If a patient has an injury or if a surgeon needs to clamp a blood vessel or if there's a rupture of an aneurysm. There's some thought that the drugs may be anti-analgesic, which means that they contribute to increased pain. The drugs are definitely anti-epileptic, which means that they will stop a seizure. Patients can become tolerant and dependent to these drugs upon multiple exposures. Methohexetol specifically can show some neuroexcitation, so myoclonus, which is muscle twitching, or hiccups, or perhaps even seizures. And at the moment, methohexetol is the current drug of choice for ECT, for electroconvulsive therapy. In the renal system, we see decreased renal blood flow, and this is mostly due to the systemic hypotension. In the liver, we see decreased hepatic blood flow, again, probably due to the um, hypotension. And we do see induction of enzymes, which means the enzymes that metabolize barbiturates uh, will start to be expressed at higher levels. It's interesting to point out as sort of a pearl that might show up on an exam, on a board exam, uh, porphyrin formation is related to barbiturate use. And porphyria is a disease that some patients have. It's a disorder of the porphyrin enzyme, which is in your heme biosynthetic pathway. And acute porphyria is a syndrome where patients overproduce and accumulate these porphyrin uh, structures. The symptoms include neurologic symptoms like pain and vomiting and even mental status changes. They can have cardiac arrhythmias and terrible pain and GI upset. So a patient who is diagnosed with porphyria, especially acute porphyria, episodes should never be given a barbiturate. It's also interesting to note that the sulfur-containing drugs, the thiobarbiturates, may evoke histamine release. This is a good point to stop and consider if you have any questions about the material. Make a note of a few questions you'd like to bring to class, or you're welcome to email me at any time for clarification of any issues. <clears throat> The second IV drug we're going to speak about is propofol, a drug that you've all given in the operating room many times already. Propofol works primarily at the GABA receptors, which means it increases activity at this inhibitory pathway. Propofol is prepared as an emulsion in intralipid. Intralipid is a white substance made out of soybean oil, glycerol, and egg lecithin. And the propofol, which is not water-soluble, is dissolved instead in this, or rather emulsed, in this substance. That's why propofol is white. We should note that egg lecithin is derived from egg yolk. So when you have a patient who's allergic to eggs and the question comes up whether or not you can give propofol, we should consider that usually egg allergies are to egg white. That's where the protein is and that's the allergen. So most of the time it's fine to give propofol to patients who have egg allergies. Nevertheless, you'll see many people who choose to avoid propofol in patients with severe egg allergies. And I have had patients come and tell me specifically that they are allergic to egg yolks uh, with serious allergic uh, reactions. 
The other important thing about interlipid is that it supports bacterial growth. It's a good bacterial medium for growth. So we have to be careful when we draw up propofol. Use an aseptic technique and discard the, vi the contents of the vial after six hours. This isn't actually supported well by evidence, although there are case reports of patients having catastrophic um, responses after being injected with propofol that's infected with bacterial contamination. There is a substance on the market called phospropofol or aquavan. It's actually a prodrug. It's a precursor to propofol. And a prodrug is metabolized into the active drug after it goes into the body. Uh, aquavan was really designed primarily for sedation, but people have used it as an induction agent, especially during propofol shortages. And its most notable side effect is perineal burning. Propofol, of course, is given IV. And because it's so lipid soluble, it crosses the blood brain barrier very quickly and then is redistributed. Um, the whole process happens in less than 10 minutes. Its biotransformation happens for sure in the liver, but actually it seems to exceed hepatic blood flow, implying that there must be some other organ that participates in propofol metabolism. Some think it may be in the lungs. The drug is metabolized about 10 times faster than thiopental, and this occurs in the liver by conjugation. Although patients who have moderate cirrhosis still process and metabolize, liver, uh, metabolize propofol pretty efficiently. The excretion is by the kidneys. And again, patients with chronic renal failure seem to have no significant change in their um, behavior when they are treated with propofol. The dosing of propofol is classically 1.5 to 2.5 milligrams per kilogram in adults. I might go up to 3 or a little bit more in children. If you're running a sedation, an infusion at 25 to 75 micrograms per kilogram per minute is typical. And as you transition to general anesthesia, infusion rates of 100 to 200 micrograms per kilogram per minute are pretty typical. The target is 4 to 6 micrograms per milliliter serum concentration, which is not something we measure in the United States, but something that is measured in other countries or targeted in other countries. Some have raised the question about risk of awareness when propofol is the sole anesthetic agent, although this should be less of a problem if benzodiazepines are given as well. And I've seen personally a higher incidence of movement when this is the sole anesthetic agent. Uh, mixing it with an, uh, an opioid or some ketamine or even together with an inhalational agent seems to help a lot with patient movement. The systemic effects of propofol are similar to those of barbiturates. So again, we see this decrease in systemic vascular resistance, this vasodilation. Uh, we do see some decrease in contractility and preload as the uh, venous pooling occurs once again, and all of this leads to hypotension. It's worse if you give the drug very quickly in our older patients and patients who have heart disease, left ventricular failure. There is some potential for bradycardia, but often I see patients become tachycardic with induction of anesthesia, and there must be some vagolytic effect going on with propofol, similar to what we see with barbiturates. The respiratory depression is similar to that of barbiturates. Patients will become depressed and then apneic. Their hypoxic and hypercapnic drives will be depressed. Loss of upper airway reflexes and airway obstruction. And the notion that thiopental causes wheezing in asthmatics uh, seems to be less of a problem when propofol is used instead. So I wouldn't say that propofol prevents or treats wheezing, but it's less of a, it's less likely to cause wheezing than thiopental and some of the other of the other barbiturates. I'd like to point out something called propofol infusion syndrome. This is a syndrome of lactic acidosis, and it usually occurs after patients have been run on propofol at a high dose for a long time. We're talking more than 75 mics per kilogram per minute for more than eight hours and often more than 24 hours. So we're talking about ICU patients. And we especially saw this in children, although it has occurred in adults as well. And these patients just develop a lipemia from the tremendous lipid load that's been infused into them, but also a rhabdomyolysis, a breakdown of muscle tissue, metabolic acidosis, and even death. Some think that this is a genetic susceptibility that's being reflected and that some patients are more likely to get propofol infusion syndrome than others. Nevertheless, you'll see in the ICU, propofol infusions, especially prolonged infusions, are being used less frequently than they were five to ten years ago, and especially in the pediatric population, 
uh, the intensivists are choosing to use fentanyl and midazolam infusions instead. In the brain, again, like barbiturates, propofol increase, decreases your cerebral blood flow, your intracranial pressure, your cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen consumption. Interestingly, propofol is a very good anti-emetic and it prevents nausea very effectively. It's also anti-epileptic. We do see some neuroexcitation in terms of myoclonic twitching or hiccuping. Patients often feel very good when they wake up from propofol. They have euphoria, they describe intense dreaming and even amorous behavior. We've had patients um, wake up from propofol anesthesia and claim that they've been uh, sexually assaulted by OR staff when in fact they were just experiencing amorous dreams. Propofol can be abused and patients can become addicted to it and there uh, is an ongoing movement to classify propofol as a controlled substance. There is not much evidence of tolerance in patients who have had multiple exposures to propofol. Most people know that propofol burns when it's injected into your IV. And the reason is probably because of the lipid solvent, the intralipid, and actually propofol itself, they both produce a substance called bradykinin. And this bradykinin vasodilates the blood vessels and it increases the contact between the aqueous phase of propofol, because uh, there's a phenol group there, and that's very irritating to the free nerve endings. And there are a few different ways that this has been treated. One is by lidocaine, and that doesn't just mean injecting lidocaine into a blood vessel. That probably does not have very much evidence that it helps. But actually, if you put lidocaine into a blood vessel while there's a tourniquet on the arm, that's called a beer block, that will actually anesthetize the blood vessel. The second way is by pre-treating with opioids. People have given remifentanil or even a little bit of fentanyl if you give enough time for it to work, and that's been shown to help quite a bit with the burning on injection. And the third way is by mixing lidocaine together with the propofol. And many think that this just acidifies the very basic propofol preparation. In fact, there was a study where instead of lidocaine, they just put hydrochloric acid into the propofol in order to acidify it. And that also decreased the burning. The last point is that lidocaine seems to inhibit bradykinin. And uh, that may be involved in the mechanism whereby lidocaine prevents the burning of propofol. We'll stop the lecture at this point and continue with the next file. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to write them down for class or contact me ahead of time.